smartest city, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. So our next crazy Canuck is Paul Mahler. And he's a mere stripling at only 67. Paul has been engaged in this uh, extraordinary pursuit of uh, designing, building, and manufacturing a personal vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. I'm hesitating because we would normally call it an airplane, but I think Paul wants something more convenient, more accessible, more easy to use, and so he adds the word car, and he calls it a sky car. He proposes, in fact, he promises a vehicle which, believe it or not, will take off from your backyard, fly 350 miles an hour, do 28 miles to the gallon, and be widely available to the general public. He's been after this ever since he graduated from engineering at McGill University with a PhD. He's not letting go and he's going to tell us why he, too, will succeed. Paul Mahler. Well, that's a, that's a hard act to follow, but... It's really an honor to be here amongst this creative group of people, not only on the stage, but in the audience as well. This morning's session certainly emphasized that. When Mr. Ford made these comments, I was a young man in the southern part of a rural part of British Columbia, living on a chicken farm, and uh, trying to find a way to get to school. It was a serious trek than did have winter in Canada, as many of you understand. One summer, I discovered a couple of hummingbirds, really the summer of my first year in school, in a trap shed near my father's farm, or near one of his chicken houses and rescued the two birds, and as I let them go, uh, they hovered momentarily and then zoomed off, and for you know, a five-year-old, they looked like they were zooming away at infinite speed, and the idea of being able to hover like that and move about at that, with that agility, that mobility, was uh, very impressive. And I thought, what a great way to get to school. <laughs> Over the next six decades, I have try to replicate that hummingbird. Replicate it in the sense of providing something that we can use in a practical way to get us from point A to point B, but using uh, essentially a medium that's really unused for the most part today. The vehicle you see behind me is a four-passenger vehicle, and of course I'm going to spend some time talking about the vehicle itself, but I've got another area that needs a lot of discussion, and that's where are we going to fly this thing and how are we going to fly it, what kind of world are we going to live in? When I was pursuing this building of a practical vertical takeoff aircraft, it really was a personal quest. You know, I, wanted to, I wanted to imitate that hummingbird. And for many years, it really only needed to be personal. But in recent years, those who drive around Toronto or Seattle or some other part of the nation, you realize that transportation is coming to a standstill in many areas. And I don't think you realize that the government has really quit building roads. You're not, and I'm speaking a little bit more about America since I know that, but certainly it's an issue that's going to be true in Canada as well. There are no more roads being built, and yet we're continuing to drive more and more. We continue moving produce uh, more and more, and the nature of anything that continues to grow without a support structure is not a picture that's going to be pretty in a few years. Our studies, studies independent of us as well by the Department of Transportation, have shown that really somewhere between five and ten years, uh, transportation is going to come to a central standstill unless we do something about it. Well, what can we do about it? We don't have a lot of options. We can't fill the sky with airplanes. That's a very efficient way to haul materials. The railways are slow. The way we get around and move things around are by trucks or personally by car. So what is the option? Some very significant statistics. 93% of us get to work by road. I can't tell you that that's true exactly in Canada, but I assume it's somewhat similar. 
perhaps very significant, 91% of the value of goods transported is by road. Average highway speed is there 30 miles an hour, and you consider, at least in America, that a lot of these crazy guys are driving 85 miles an hour, it means a lot of us are going at about two miles an hour. But that's the average speed, and in between five and 10 years, the complete system is gonna to come to what I would say would be a failure, and the Department of Transportation supports that. What we really need to do to solve that problem, we certainly need a vehicle with VTO capability, but we need a infrastructure, an electronic highway in the sky, a world where your vehicle is going to be controlled by onboard computers and offboard computing, where you're a passenger being delivered from point A to point B. This is the aircraft in its hover mode where the nacelles are rotated through about 45 degrees, and then as you move forward, they also rotate down to the final 45 degrees. The actual air is deflected another 45 degrees through a series of vanes in the exit, and the vehicle then has the ability to transition to forward flight, return to vertical flight and land, and then be driven back to your home in principle. This is a short piece I'm gonna show you where you can actually see some of the components in the aircraft. It's a, an example of how the vehicle you might, if you could turn on the lights. I'd like to sum that part up of where we ended up at this point as an economically practical machine. Certainly, we've made a great deal. We've really been engine, an engine company for the last 15 years developing these engines because we wanted to develop a very low cost, powerful engine. We have an engine right now that you can hold in a hand bucket, really, that puts out 150 horsepower. We have eight engines in the vehicle. We can harbor with an engine fail. In fact, on two occasions, I've had an engine fail. And in one case, I landed the vehicle without even knowing the engine failed because the computer system is so quick to respond to something going wrong. It just corrects the power on the other engines and the vehicle didn't even, didn't even distort slightly, even for a fraction of a second. I really needed to have these fans separated so that if an engine failed, the vehicle wouldn't come down because the most important thing is you know something's going to fail somewhere in this machine sometime. So you have to design the machine so that no single component is going to bring the vehicle down. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And tells you a little bit why I've spent 40 some years in the process of trying to do it. Environmentally attractive, um, the way it's operated, first off, we run in alcohol. There's many reasons why we use alcohol. Uh, alcohol is a uh, much safer fuel. Electronic hardware is very important, but we all know what's happened to computers in the last few years. We've been able to get computing down to a tremendous amount of power in a very small package, and that's exciting. I mean, this is a flying computer. I don't do the flying. I, I just sit there and pray a little as I, as I move along. I, I'm, I'm just actually a commander of the ship, so to speak. I push the stick forward, it goes forward. I push the stick backward, it comes backwards. I leave the stick alone, it stays there and waits for my command. So there's no skill involved, and there never will be. And finally, I would suggest this inevitable. And I will give the quote, close to the quote of Dr. Daniel Golden. He was the ex-head of uh, NASA for many years. And uh, while I would argue uh, the fact that we seem to be devoting more energy to getting around on Mars than we are on Earth at the moment. That should change. Uh, Mr. Golden was an advocate of many of the efforts to get around on Mars, but he made the comment in a national forum when he was describing an aviation vision of the future that within 10 years, 25% of us will have access to this type of technology, and within 25 years, 90% of us will have access to this type of technology. And uh, coming from him, it certainly has more credibility than my own vested interest. Thank you very much. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com.